Welcome everyone and thank you all for being with us today. Um, this is the second in our Cambridge Laser Series with CRASH. CRASH is a centre for research in the arts, social sciences and humanities at the University of Cambridge, a truly interdisciplinary hub that also bridges academia and the city. Our first laser, hosted by the Newhall Arts Collection and its curator Harriet Loeffler, celebrated women pioneers spearheading the creative loci where art, sciences and technology meet. And today's event is curated by another pioneering woman, Chrissy Nanu, musician, academic and technologist. And we welcome a new member to our team, Perona Prasad, a curator of the Hayong Gallery. This is a beautiful gem in the heart of Cambridge, a welcoming space between the university and the city. For those of you joining the Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous for the first time, it has its origins in the 1950s with the American scientist Molina, who brought together scientific experience with artistic sensibility to explore a new art form, kinetic art, and went on to found the Leonardo Journal, a global platform for art and science. Later that decade, Snow with his work Two Cultures opens a debate on whether humanities and sciences are separate or distinct. His experience of moving between disciplines, practices and encountering boundaries is something we share today. Here in Cambridge, between the two sister universities and the city's art science networks, we have a growing art and science community. In fact, I hear the new Cavendish Art Science Programme begins soon. The Cambridge Laser joins the arena and questions the separation and propagation of art and science as distinct categories of knowing and being. In our series, we ask fundamental questions such as what is creativity in science and the arts? What is experimental practice in art, science or philosophy? How do scientific and artistic attitudes, inquiries, methods overlap and essentially differ? And importantly, purpose. How can such understanding shape our technological, urban, economic and environmental futures for an ecologically and socially sustainable life and well-being? So why art and science of data? An engineer and poet once said, engineering is an art and said of data, it lies on a spectrum from data to action. To paraphrase him, one needs to know how to use data, transform it into information, then become skilled in using information by applying and embodying it so that one has knowledge. And ultimately one can become experienced in this knowing and acquire wisdom. And this enables us to take action grounded in wisdom. Today, the focus in our society seems to be giving salience to the data part of the spectrum, perhaps affected by ideas of human reconfigured by concepts of technology, perhaps. If that's so, what does that mean for us? As part of the Cambridge Laser, today's events begins a series curating how the arts and sciences perceive, collect and use data and infer, imagine and experience what data means and how we as publics engage with this. The artist Victoria Vesno, who's with us today, describes how an aesthetic emerges when artists create work using vast amounts of information and creating interactive artwork generates even more information with audience participation. So she advises her students to think about making the storage and manipulation of data part of their designs from the inception. Otherwise they may use preconceptions of how data be organized and that may run counter to the meaning of their projects. A core question she asks, as artists, how can we represent information without dehumanizing it? Especially, as she says, given the speed of computing power, miniaturization, ample storage. And it's a question we may be raising in future laser discussions, for instance, regarding mental health and well being. For today, we are going to experience examples of how art, in this case music, can do just this. And I will now pass the baton to the wonderful Perona Prasad. Good evening. Um, it's a wonderful um, event for me to start my um, relationship with laser. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's really um, pertinent that the Hyong Gallery is involved um, in this project because the Hyong Gallery is a free public exhibition space in Downing College. Um, one of the constituent colleges of Cambridge University, and it's a space um, that is dedicated to contemporary and modern art. As such, we are um, part of um, an institution where, um, you know, we have a diverse academic community that is working on all aspects of humanities, science, social science, and also working on many critical subjects 
climate change, inequality, racial injustice, gender, um, and coming at it from all different disciplines. So our program of events at the Hyong Gallery always um, reflects this, um, this fact that we are situated within this academic community and our exhibitions form the backdrop and the context for um, a variety of talks, discussions and um, performances of music, um, theatrical performances um, uh, and such like that kind of e examine this, um, the overlaps uh, between the works on the walls and uh, the work that our academic community is engaged in um, at, in Cambridge um, in a cross-disciplinary sort of way. So I'm really, really pleased um, to be a part of this today. Uh, it reminds me of an event that we held in 2018 um, when um, our uh, geography fellow, Michael Bravo, rolled out these phenomenal large maps um, of the Arctic that he had asked um, elders um, in Nunavut to mark up with their routes through the Arctic, challenging the idea of the Northwest Passage and European exploration. So this is right up our street and I hope that you can come to some of our events and our exhibitions when we reopen. I'm going to hand over to the person who's coordinated this um, evening's um, this evening's um, sort of discussions and program, and that's Chrissy Nanu. So, Chrissy, over to you. Hello, good evening, and I would like to extend my welcome to the virtual audience uh, that's with us tonight. Um, I'm Chrissy and I'm a PhD candidate at the Center for Music and Science in Cambridge. Um, I'm a pianist by trade um, and I spent my formative years in Paris and then at the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics or CARMA at Stanford, uh, where my affinity for contemporary music developed and expanded to include new media and technologies. Um, as part of this initiative uh, for science and arts in Cambridge, we decided to join our voice today to raise awareness to the environmental changes occurring around us and focus our talk um, around the discussion with pieces made from and for environmental data. There are numerous pieces and works based on data from the environment and there are different ways uh, of representing them and sound and music. Uh, but we can distinguish between two different two main ways of representation. The first one is a direct translation of a data set the measurements, um, the numbers to sound. So parameters, peaks, patterns uh, that we can, uh, we can see through the data set can be made into sounds using different mapping strategies. The second way that is also very, very popular um, is a field recording of the environment. It's, it's a sort of snapshot of the acoustic identity of a place that includes animal cries um, and sounds, eyes, wind, and human noises. The pieces we present here today are particular um, as they integrate both the composers made into music a data set that is accompanied by the unfolding ecosystem the measurements were taken from. The embedded ecosystem then has become a musical and performance structure. For the first piece, um, Ice Prints, um, it is composed by Matthew Bergner, who is one of our guests today. Um, Matthew is uh, the Eleanor Shi Professor of Music and Composition and Computer Technologies at the University of Virginia. He's the co-director of Coastal Futures Conservatory and the director of the Alaska-based Ecosono nonprofit organization. Um, Matthew has a lot of pieces. He's a native of Alaska and he has a lot of pieces about snow and ice. And Ice Prince is one of the first pieces I ever played that uses environmental data. Um, so I'm going to take you underwater, immersed in the Arctic Sea off the Alaska coast today, during the melting season among seals, whales, and uh, ice, a lot of ice. Um, the ice is crackling, breaking, popping, and the piano part I play along uh, represents 40 years of Arctic ice data using the different octaves or register of the piano. 
to represent the data. Um, the original data for this piece was by Dr. Aiken, who's a professor of geophysics at the University of Alaska, uh, who cannot be here today because of the Arctic Summit. And I recorded this piece um, at the Rancilia Polytechnic in the studio a month ago, where I'm a, you know, I'm a visiting faculty this year. So we'll play a small excerpt for, excerpt for you, and then Matthew will actually talk a little bit more about it. So Matthew, if you would like to take over, yes.
That's terrific, Chrissy. It's so beautiful. I love how you make the the data sing so musically. Um, it's really something else. So I just wanted to follow up with that a little bit uh, about what's happening, what she's what she's playing there, and then um, look at some uh, some newer work. So the piece is uses a three channel field recording under the Arctic ice as Chrissy described. And it also uses a second data set, which is the 40 years of ice extent. Um, the ice extent creates the harmonic form. And then that's applied to the um, to filter coefficients that uh, through which the, the Arctic ice is 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 played and then all of this is transcribed for um for the piano so here's the the data set um the the sub ice hydrophone recordings and then here's the 40 years of sea arctic of arctic sea ice extent mapped across 40 pages of piano music so each page 30 seconds is a year of of data and 30 seconds of real time audio. Um, and you can see in the graph how it goes from 1970 to 2010. Um, each year is uh, marked by a high ice extent, a low ice extent, and then this, this green line that um, goes between them is the data that's actually used in the score. Um, in the piano piece, this is page one from the piece. So we have, there's that green line, um, the thawing, and then the refreezing of the ice for that year. And then here's 30 seconds of the, of the hydrophone recording showing the deformations in the ice. And then um, that has been transcribed into the piano part in the, in the manner that the ice articulates the piano. So events that happen in the ice are transcribed into piano uh, pitches and rhythms. But all of that is uh, determined, those notes and the harmonic framework is determined by the annual thawing and refreezing. So what you'll notice is as we move through the graph, this we're moving from the high to the lower range of the piano just because there was less and less ice extent over the 40 year period. Um, of course, every year it's thawing and refreezing. So if you look at like page two, 1971, it's slightly different. Um, it's re reaching down, you know, a little bit lower into the piano range and correspondingly will have somewhat lower notes in the piano. Um, events that are not ice, like whales and seal that were recorded as part of the audio file are not represented in the, in the piece. Um, so here's 1986. And again, you can see we have a different 30 seconds of ice and a different uh, 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 annual thawing and refreezing cycle. And um, this is 2007, which was the lowest point of ice extent in the model that I used in that 40 years. And so you can see here that the that when it thawed in the summer of 2007, it reaches the bottom of the range of the piano. And there it is. Um, when an ice event happens, it's it's playing the low, you know, the very bottom of the piano range. And um, if we look at, you know, since that time, this piece went to 2010, but you know, since 2010, we've broken the low ice extent many times. Uh, in, and notably in 2012, my, luckily I didn't write the piece in, in 2012, otherwise I would have been off the range of the piano altogether. Uh, we've well, well broken the, the system and we're not on the piano anymore. 2020 um, was the lowest ice extent on record uh, that we have so far. Um, I'd like to share a couple of more pieces briefly. This is Syntax of Snow. It's a piece for, for percussion, a percussionist or up to four percussionists who play snow and bells. And um, the idea is to map the, the map a musical syntax into a performance of snow um, as it undergoes change. So the instrument is highly variable in contrast to the bells, which always sound the same. But every, uh, every note in the, 
in the bell part is mapped to a specific snow gesture. And that snow is amplified with microphones inside the snow and in the air above the snow. The performer plays the snow with a gloved hand and the bell with the, with the other hand. And they play those things in unison. So the both hands move in unison. Um, every time a note, say C, is played, they, they uh, play the snow with the note touched lightly. So every time C is played touched lightly, touching lightly the snow, every time E is played, tapping the snow, um, and so on. So that a listener can hear uh, across a performance, they can start associating um, certain sounds, certain notes with behaviors in the material of the snow. And that is meanwhile undergoing a transformation. So this is what the score looks like. This is what the performer plays. Um, and here is an example of, this is not a, a beautiful recording, but it is um, just taken with my phone before a, you know, in the rehearsal before a concert of Yi Jin Fong playing it so that you can see how it's, uh, how it's working. I always imagine playing this this piece in uh, in the winter time, seasonal music. But of course, it it gets programmed outside of winter. It gets played in the you know places where there aren't isn't snow, and um, gets played in concert halls. And so you know that's been challenging to figure out how to uh, interpret the piece for different kinds of musical contexts. The last thing I'd like to share is some recent work uh, at the Beaufort Lagoons Ecosystem, the BLE Long Term Ecological Research. Center, which is a series of sites in the Arctic along the, the, the north coast of Alaska. And um, uh, the group of scientists that I've been collaborating with here are monitoring the Beaufort Lagoons and um, trying to understand the highly dynamic ecosystem, which is uh, moves from something very static in the winter when everything's locked up in ice and to this incredible burst of, of activity when the, when the ice melts and the sun comes back in full 24 hours a day and plants grow and animals come and it becomes like very, very dynamic. Uh, so I work alongside the, the scientists with my, with my equipment um, and I, I do my own uh, experiments, but I also uh, record things that they're working on, make field recordings that might be useful for them, and in other ways try to uh, help document their, their research for their presentations through sound. So one of the experiments that I did recently is a field recording uh, made under the ice. Again, this is on the Arctic Ocean in the, Bu in the Beaufort Sea and uh, in a lagoon um, along the coast. Uh, we have microphones in the air, microphones, a microphone in the ice, and microphones in the water under the ice, and then one in the sediment at the bottom of the lagoon. And um, in the winter time, which is when this particular recording was made, it's all together, it makes a pretty uh, noisy, whoops, noisy sounding recording. Again, there's like nothing happening there except the wind, maybe slight currents in this in the in the water. But you can parse out the different layers of this as separate channels and listen to, for example, what's happening in the sediment under the lagoon. So this data set is um, this audio data is is layered with. Uh, data that the scientists are collecting. And 
Um, this is from uh, the Stephenson Sound data set. This is long-term ecological research. So they are monitoring the, the sites for years. And this piece uses one year of data. Um, presumably, as we keep collecting more data, we'll have more and more years of this um, to be able to compare. But already across one year, it's really exciting to be able to, to understand, learn about the um, dynamics of the system. So the, the, the four sensor readings that I used in the sonification uh, were light, that is light under the ice, which is very dark in the winter, and then um, and then a burst of light as the ice melts and light can reach underwater. Temperature, which obviously is cold in the winter and then warms when the light is um, enters the, the lagoon in the summertime. Um, velocity of the currents, which are more determined by the wind movement than the tides in the winter, but then come under tidal influence in the summer. And then the salinity, which is very high in the winter, but then drops off in the summer as a result of the, the, the ice melt and, and the freshwater rivers that come from uh, the mountains and the Arctic National Wildlife Reserve into the lagoon. And so the sonification takes those four data sets and, and uh, maps them into synthesizers. The, the, um, the velocity of the water movement is mapped into a kind of granulation engine so that grains per second tracks the velocity of the water. And so you can hear the density of that as, as it goes. The salinity um, and the temperature work together on a noise system to use, using a high pass and band pass filters. And then the light is mapped into a harmonic uh, resonant filter. This is January in the winter. And you'll notice at the beginning of every month, I've added a tone. So there it is. That's not part of the sonification, but rather it marks time so that we can tell where we are in the annual cycle. very still in the winter, but at the very end of June, the very beginning of July, listen to the explosion in the data. As the ice cover builds up again in October, the light recedes, the ice locks up the tidal movement and it returns to that um, static time of winter.
and we're back pretty much where we started again. So if you look at the sonogram of the of the piece, that with the sonification that we just heard, you can see um, how closely it models the data that that we have. So you can see the this band here that represents the um, the movement of the of the water, the velocity becomes more dense in the in the months uh, of summer. The filtered noise that's both subtractive and bandpass filtered tracks the the um, the data that we have, and then you can see these harmonic nodes are the markers of the months. So the music is um, you know pretty pretty well derived directly from those those various data sets. So that's really what I wanted to share with you today. And again, I just want to say thank you to Chrissy for that beautiful performance of Ice Prince. Um, it's just really incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I was going to say, for those of you who did not um, um, had the chance to, to listen to those pieces, we have a playlist at the same spot on uh, Leonardo YouTube channel. All the pieces of today, they're there. They're very few. Um, and we would also expand the playlist for afterwards with new pieces from artists, et cetera. So this, the, the, the list is definitely not you know, exhausted today. Um, for our second piece and our second guest, um, I'm thrilled to, to actually have with us today Chris, Chris Chafe. Um, he's the director of the Center for Computer Research and Music and Acoustics at Stanford, and he's the Duke of Harmony Professor of Humanities and Science uh, there. Um, his works include gallery and museum music installations, which are now um, into their second decade, with musicifications uh, result resulting from collaborations with artists, scientists, and MDs. Recent work includes the Earth Symphony, the Brain Stethoscope Project, the Polar Tide for the 2013 Venice Piennale, the Tomato Quintet for the TransLife Media Festival, and the National Art Museum of China. Um, the piece that we're going to listen today by Chris, composed by Chris, played by Chris, uh, but not uh, recorded by him. The video is by Greg Nemeyer, who's a professor of media innovation at UCLA. Berkeley and uh, a close collaborator of his. And it takes place, um, I mean, it takes us on the shore of Crazy Field in the Bay Area of San Francisco, the Golden Gate Park, just off south, I think, of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, the data set he's using is 100 years of Tato records acquired by the gorge on the shore adjacent to where this recording takes place. And then the audio and the video are mixed following the original pipe.
Okay, thanks for um, playing that. That version that you heard is, uh, can, oh, can you hear me okay, Chrissy? Just check if Chrissy can hear me. I need to slow that down, sorry about that. Oops. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so uh, there's two versions of this short kind of fun experiment that we did back in uh, back in summer of 2019. Uh, the version you just saw and heard is the one that actually plays the sonification alongside the cello playing. And this is an improvisation on a sonification that was computer generated. So there's a version which you can play, which is just the cello and video. And this is the version we heard, which is the cello plus the sonification. I'll kind of explain you know, where that's um, uh, all about. And I'll put, actually first, I'll just put in the chat um, the link to the version that doesn't have the sonification. So if you ever wanna check it out separately, um, kind of brings up, you know, even, even there, the question of how much reveal do you wanna have about the sort of backstory, the, the, the data set that was, was driving the music or do you wanna appreciate the music alone, you know? And, and I think that's a continuum, it's not a polar thing, you know? And I go back and forth, you know, it's a, it's a great discussion to have and music that has a programmatic um, explanation, you know, that, that, that's been around for a long time. What are love songs, you know? Uh, they, have, they have extra information attached to them too. Uh, so does the Symphony Fantastique, uh, you know, there's, there's stories, you know. So uh, in this case, the story is the data and the experiment that we, um, we saw, let me go into uh, a little bit of uh, uh, what, what we've got to share here. Um, and show you the cover of a book. This is Earth 2020, a collection that was uh, compiled for Earth Day, April 2020. The Earth Day that's gonna be in the record books is the one that never happened. Uh, Earth Day is a Northern, generally speaking, it's a, it's a North American um, uh, celebration of the Earth beginning in 1970. So the 2020 anniversary was the 50th anniversary. And my colleague, Philippe Hortel, who's a scientist at the University of British Columbia, um, uh, compiled uh, work and writings by artists, photographers, and a whole bunch of his colleagues in, um, in the environmental sciences. So Philippe is a professor of Earth, Ocean, Atmospheric Sciences at, at UBC got a hold of me and we decided to take some of the um, uh, data sets that spanned the 50 years of Earth days and use those to create the parts of an Earth symphony. So, uh, you know, a sadly postponed project because of the pandemic, but uh, still yet to happen. So um, one of the concepts back summer 19 when we're thinking about this earth symphony was to do a bit of location recording and get some folks um, uh, perhaps on video performing parts of the symphony from location and uh, this this uh, bit that you just saw was actually a, a, a test for that uh, just a location test to see uh, what we might you know try to try to do along those lines um, and the location was chosen by my colleague, uh, Greg Niemeyer. Here's Greg in Venice when we were doing a, uh, uh, another uh, uh, sea level rise piece, which was called Polar Tide. And the um, particular suggestion of Greg's was based on this report from the um, U.S. Geographical Survey, which is the, the ge geologic survey, sorry, which, which is a couple years prior, and it was written about uh, the, you know, sort of variability of, of uh, tides in the San Francisco Bay region 
and that we occasionally have these very uh, astonishing El Nino events. Uh, compared to this year, we're in something called La Nina, which is kind of the flip of that, you know, and it has to do with ocean temperature driving large changes. And the article depicts 100 years of uh, measurements from a uh, tidal gauge, which is uh, very near to where I was playing the electronic cello. And you can see the data record there. We'll go into it a little more, but it's, uh, it's gonna relate to, I think, some things that we're gonna see later in this evening's uh, discussion. Um, and uh, this is the tidal station that, that was the one that produced this record. The record, as you can see, there's a kind of monotonic increase in uh, the, the, you know, so that median line is just, just rising all the time. And that, that's kind of the background rise of sea level that we're witnessing globally. But, you know, superimposed on that are these variations, which are seasonal and also sort of epics of things like El Nino's that are, that are depicted here. So this is the data set for the work that Chrissy just played for you, the metered tide. Um, so this is sampled uh, very finely from that station. I was using a technique for sonification of that, <clears throat> which I um, you know, used basically to take a one dimensional time series and I can drive uh, the parameters of a computer synthesis, just almost like think of a whistling sound that goes up and down in pitch as the uh, graph goes up and down, but it's, Generally, I'll do more than just pitch going up and down. I might play with amplitude, or in the case of the sonification here, there was a voice synthesis, so there would be vowel changes that track uh, these um, fluctuations as well. And the location, you know, we're, we're sort of doing the making of the metered tide now, I guess. Um, so the location was uh, just left of the tidal gauge, which you can kind of see sticking off the jetty there. Uh, Greg was scouting uh, the day before, you know, like where do you, where do you sit a cello player when they're on the beach? Um, and uh, when we arrived with the equipment, um, just basically wired it up so that the cello was being recorded uh, directly and the sound was entirely electronic. You couldn't hear anything during the, um, the shoot because uh, basically all you heard was waves and seagulls. Uh, what I heard, what was going into my ear uh, in an earbud was that sonification. And that's what I was uh, improvising with. So I'll give you, you know, just, just to remind you what you were, that part of what you were hearing. Um, hopefully this will play for you. So those are the fluctuations from the graph. And it starts low like this. And after a hundred years, which is being compressed into three minutes, it ends very, very uh, active and much higher. Let's see if I scooch forward. So we're getting closer to now. And we made seven takes of this uh, improvisation. Um, so end of the day with seven takes, uh, separate three minute uh, performances. And I kind of wondered what would I do, you know, as a montage, because, you know, it was a, it was a very wonderful day. I mean, we, we, we felt kind of connected, you know, it was a really interesting thing. I, I think we amazed some joggers, uh, you know, but, but as far as the end of the day, we had seven takes and uh, what are we going to do with it? Well, you know, just to take it a little further, uh, I thought about maybe doing a montage of the seven takes automatically, something I had not tried before, and do it automatically in a way that's driven by the data itself. So the ratio of cuts between take one, take two, take three, and so on is being also manipulated by the uh, th three minute performance of that data set. So, so now it's, it's, it's kind of like a hyper parameter, I guess you would say. Um, and to explain that a little more clearly, I'll, I'll, I'll play a video and it may not, it may not print really well in, um, 
Zoom, but I'll give it a whack. And uh, you, you, what you'll hear is a 15 second clip of just the video of me playing the cello. And then that same clip with the sonification playing uh, exactly what you heard at the beginning from Chrissy playing it. Um, so it'll be the cello alone, then it'll be cello plus sonification, and then that will repeat one more time. So uh, the same clip over and over again, just so you can maybe, you know, hear into the process of uh, this, this montage that assembled the final mix. <laughs> Once more, the straight cello. And with the electronic. So now you know what was playing in my right ear uh, from that. And the, um, you know, the, the final result is, is probably two things. It's, uh, you know, besides, besides the sort of work itself, I think it's a, an accidental foray back into something called Flickr film, which Greg and I had never messed with before, but it has a, a long history sort of, uh, really kind of interestingly uh, kind of almost profoundly a part of my uh, kind of early 20s you know um, bunch of bunch of uh, film uh, you know filmmakers who messed with flip books and, and chopping up cellulose to create this sort of uh, flicker type of um, uh, medium that was very abstract in ways. Uh, the second thing that this is, is it's a performance on my, uh, by me on my cholletto that I could never play. So this is way beyond my chops to actually play as, you know, in a, in a straight shot and uh, kind of fun, fun outcome for it. But, you know, in the end, what this is, this is just a play test for something called the Earth Symphony that, um, you know, would have, you know, folks in, uh, you know, if we were lucky, like Matthew Bertner's uh, locations, you know, on ice sheets in the Arctic and, uh, you know, here, I hate to put one of my players near one of the fires that we just had 10 miles from my house uh, over this last summer. So, you know, the changing conditions, they, they are imprinting themselves on, you know, our creative work in so many different ways. I, uh, you know, that's a long topic. Um, and uh, really want to thank you all for the, for the gathering today and bringing us all together. And hello to a lot of friends who've uh, not, uh, haven't seen for a while. And this is a great opportunity at least uh, to get, get back in touch briefly. So take care. Thank you, Chris, for all this. Um, I would like to, um, introduce you today, um, if Aaron is still with us, I would like to introduce you to um, Aaron O'Connell, who is, um, um, I'm not sure if he, how would represent him, but I think he's um, an enabler of actually of all the species that happen and all these collaborations between artists and scientists. Aaron um, is the found the founder director of the Arctic Circle and the director of the Open Bay Center, a wilderness conservancy and art science center for research in the North Pacific Discovery Islands. Um, I, I, I know about the Arctic Circle Foundation, but actually the next piece that I will present after, after that will be, is one of the results of these collaborations. Um, so if Aaron would like to present for a few seconds, the trips that he actually 
takes the people on that is beautiful and I'm sure you've images afterwards. Uh, thank you, Chrissy. Um, and uh, thanks for all the Leonardo and Laser folks for inviting me to join you today. Uh, I must say, uh, uh, listening to uh, listening and watching our panel members uh, reminds me quite a bit of life on board uh, our <laughs> ship. Uh, we run a, a high Arctic uh, uh, residency for artists and scientists um, aboard a specially outfitted uh, sailing vessel. Our area of uh, study is. Uh, uh, in uh, rather our territory is in the uh, high Arctic uh, uh, archipelago of Svalbard. Uh, judging by some of the work we've seen here, you, you may be uh, familiar with uh, uh, that, that area. We've been working in Svalbard uh, uh, since uh, 2009. And uh, over the years, uh, like Chrissy has said, we've become uh, enablers by creating the platform uh, to uh, invite in international artists, uh, scientists, architects, educators into a collaborative, uh, intense period uh, at sea and uh, on land uh, throughout the, the high Arctic. Um, I did mention to uh, uh, Chrissy and in the chat that I, 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 I blocked out only an hour to join you today and I can see this discussion is going to go uh, in depth for some time. So thanks for uh, fitting me in for uh, just a, a short introduction. Um, I can share a little bit uh, about um, uh, what we do through our website. Uh, hopefully you're viewing this now. So again, the Arctic Circle invites international artists, scientists, uh, innovators, and thinkers to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, explore, uh, to experiment uh, in, uh, in a high Arctic setting uh, collaboratively. Um, our expeditions uh, uh, take place uh, at different types of year, uh, different times of year, uh, summer, when we have uh, 24 hours of uh, uh, daylight. And we also do a, an annual expedition in the uh, onset of Arctic winter, where we have uh, a very different set of uh, conditions. Um, there's so much to delve into in what we do uh, when we begin to consider each an individual project and uh, 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 project that goes through our, our program. So I, I prefer just to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the general uh, project in, in that we provide the platform and uh, seek to attract uh, 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 the, those uh, um, proposing projects, much like what I've seen here uh, today uh, on, uh, in this laser talk to, to enable that type of work, to enable that type of discussion. Uh, our work uh, from the Arctic Circle program is uh, shown and published uh, internationally. And I, I believe we've reached you know, tens of millions of eyes over, uh, over the last decade and a half. It's something that uh, we uh, en endeavor to, to do is to enable work and uh, uh, then to communicate, help to communicate uh, that work. Seeing that I have only a few moments, uh, would it be appropriate for me to perhaps hand it over to the panel or the viewers to, uh, to uh, for per perhaps a, a little rapid fire uh, question and answer session? Uh, does that, uh, how does that sound? Absolutely. Yep, so if there are questions for Arana, please go ahead from the panelists, maybe. I'm curious if you're continuing with your expeditions during this COVID time with the artists. I'm sorry, the question again is? I was curious if you're doing the expeditions with residencies during the COVID times. No. Pandemic. No, we're on pause, just like the rest of the world. <laughs> I thought you would be isolated in the Arctic. It's 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 getting there, and uh, 
um, of course, I, th I think it's it's quite the opposite. It's uh, putting uh, people on ships in some of the most remote parts of the world that must travel from all corners of the world is uh, rather taboo at the moment. So no, we're patiently uh, sitting it out. Uh, we may return to the Arctic late uh, this year for our winter uh, expedition. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to you know, looking forward to being back under sail and enabling uh, the, the types of work that we're talking about today. If that's it, uh, thank you all. Uh, I wish you well in all your endeavors, and uh, I'll be signing off. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you very thank much you. for that. And by the way, I will be showing you the ship where every all of this is taking place. Um, with the next piece that I'm going to present. Uh, the next piece is by, um, I'm going to play a short excerpt from Frostbite, Chalk Outline, a piece by Daniel Blinkhorn, who's an Australian composer. Um, um, Daniel teaches at the Conservatory um, of uh, Sydney, the University of Sydney. And um, he couldn't be with us today, uh, but he uploaded and shared a video clip where he explains his work. At the same spot at the Laser Cambridge YouTube um, channel, you can find his interview. The link will be there. And um, he's, uh, this, this, this piece was composed actually with um, Arctic uh, video and audio footage um, during his 2011, I think, resi uh, residency on the Arctic Circle Foundation. So the piece combines Arctic video and audio recordings that they were taking during the, the, the boat expedition on the Svalbard archipelago, the Arctic Sea. Um, so the coastline becomes a reference to the antiquity, you know, forensic technique of drawing a chalk outline around the deceased. So actually, that was uh, Daniel's metaphor for the for the melting ice. Um, Daniel is a composer and digital media artist and a field recordist. I will play a small excerpt of the. Oops, I find it.
So that was first by, by Daniel. And in case you were wondering, so the recording is also live. Um, and um, I'm playing off the video. So basically, I know the video and the electronic sounds. And I have a piano score. And I just play it forward. So there's a lot of counting involved, but let's say. <laughs> For the next uh, for the next guest, I'm delighted to actually uh, welcome with us um, a magist from um, from UCLA, Victoria Vesna. Um, I am always on the paper on my notes. Um, so Victoria is an artist and a professor in design media arts in UCLA. She's the director of the Art Science Center in the School of Arts in California Nano Systems Institute. Her work involves long-term collaborations with composers, nanoscientists, neuroscientists, and evolutionary biologists. With her installations, she investigates how communication psychologies affect collective behavior and perception of identity shift in relation to scientific innovation. So she's going to take us back under the water this time again to an invisible and inaudible environment to us that is deeply secluded. Um, the protagonists in Victoria Vesna's installation um, are seven microorganisms enlarged and rendered in 3D in the anthropogenic noise that surrounds them. Thank you, Chrissy, and thank you, Satender. Always good to see you. It's been a while. Uh, how wonderful to see all these works and everything's dealing with water and ice. It's pretty amazing. So I'll start with a short clip and then I'll explain a little bit and we can start our conversation. Actually, it's more like 70%, uh, if not 80% of the air we breathe is produced by plankton and every second breath. So as the project continued, I discovered more and more about the importance of plankton. And just to take you back a little bit, um, I was invited about four years ago by Dr. Alfred Bendel, who is the director of scientific visualization in Vienna, the Angewandte to do something with these incredible animations of plankton. He had seven species that were commissioned by Terence Malick, the filmmaker, and last minute they weren't used. So he kept coming at me. I was working on some other projects. I was in residence in Vienna. And I kept looking at these plankton. They're amazing. And the fact that they were 3D scanned, these micro creatures just was blowing me away. But I didn't know what to do. And uh, his PhD student at the time, now she's graduated, Martina Broschel, did the beautiful animations. So I kept looking and, and that, um, my film went back to a time when I did another project called Water Bowls, where I worked with hydrophones and I was looking specifically at underwater pollution. 
and I got some uh, recordings from the Oceanographic Society. And then I asked, well, I know that uh, whales, we all know that whales and dolphins and other larger creatures uh, are seriously affected um, by the underwater noise, not to mention pollution, etc. But what about plankton? What about these micro creatures? And of course, there's very, very little research on this. Um, a little bit more now, there's a little more consciousness now. And, uh, the idea of microplastics, nanoplastics, and uh, noise pollution became the center to me. So I decided to uh, blow up the planktons to be as large as whales. And then I'll very briefly again show you different iterations of this project. So this is, uh, these are some images that I'd like to share with you just to quickly explain. So this first image uh, is actually, are you seeing this? Am I in the right? Yep. So this first image is where we managed to do it in um, virtual reality, where you, you're really truly immersed in underwater and in sound, and you're uh, trying to balance yourself. So if you get yourself at a perfect centered balance, then the plankton appears towards you. Uh, as in, in, in this image, this is in, in the, um, Ars Electronica in the deep space. Uh, most of the time, people are not able to balance themselves, so they actually create the noise. Um, and the noise is fracking, uh, shipping, crashing, uh, sonar experiments, etc. If you do manage to center yourself, uh, the plankton comes towards you and you hear the sounds of a whale song in the distance. Uh, it was done with uh, 24 speakers at one point, different iterations in different places, just to whatever it takes to raise awareness about it and really, um, show the magnificence of these creatures. I mean, we did, we had the opportunity to work with seven, but there's a thousand probably that we don't even know about. When you're immersed in the noise, um, after a few tests, I realized I cannot do it for more than 10, 15 seconds without everybody leaving the room. So that would be pretty much uh, the most is 30 seconds, but I would also remind everybody that this is 24 seven, the, these underwater creatures are bombarded. Um, here's another version that was uh, in Pula in Croatia uh, at the Marine Museum. And here we had no possibility for anything high tech, but we did have a good sound system and, and the, the Pula Aquarium was next door. So we collaborated with them and actually put three, uh, uh, aquariums with three different types of planktons. And people would come and look and say, oh, there's nothing there. And no, there is something there. There's a lot there so to make that connection. And then uh, the last thing I wanted to show is uh, doing an online version, which I will explain in a second. Um, this became a very interesting uh, collaboration and experiment that we continue to work on to see if we can work from different locations with sound files and image files and binaural uh, sound so that when somebody's uh, listening to it, they would make this screen full screen and then listen to the sound and really get into um, actually a, a guided meditation that throws you into the, the sound uh, and the uh, environment. Let's see if I can get out of this full screen here. I'm going to just show a couple of minutes of this. One second. So here we actually used also imagery uh, uh, from the microscopy of Thomas Schwacher. 
these biologists in Vienna are just mind blowing the kind of work they do. Um, here's a brief excerpt. This is now uh, created online. So the voice that you heard was from Anna Nahir, whose image you also saw briefly. Um, and um, she, was, she was coming to us from Slovakia. Uh, Paul Jaluso was in New York. Uh, I was in Palm Springs actually at the time and Clinton, whose also image was there, was in uh, Los Angeles with Ivana. And we managed to have the sound and the audio and the others kind of participate in a way that really, I think, has so much potential. So I'm uh, trying to explore more and more this way of sharing and composing and trying to get into the environment. And we also are experimenting now with, uh, I'm so sorry about this. <laughs> We're also experimenting with um, AR so that people can be off the screen and listen, but you know, headphones are absolutely necessary to really get the kind of uh, binaural recordings that we did. Mixing um, some of the actual microscopic images, some of the actual data, the, um, and then the animated that's also uh, scanned from the creatures themselves. So that, that's my little bit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. Um, so at the beginning, there's always data. Um, and I would like to actually take the chance to uh, bring in the conversation one of our attendees, who, Nicola, who was saying about, uh, there was a question about the panelists and composers' performance, etc. Do you consider what you do to be science communication? And if you do, what do you think is the function of science communication in musical form as opposed to others? And I will take the chance before you start answering this question to show you what the other forms of the data sets look like. And I would bring in the conversation uh, Professor Richard Wolfson. Um, 
who is the Emeritus Professor of Physics, Benjamin Whistler, Emeritus Professor of Physics at Middlebury College. Um, he also taught at the Environmental Studies program there at, at the Middlebury Institute of Monterey. And his research involves sun, climate change, and solar energy. He's the author of numerous books, but um, the one that stands out for me just because it's around the theme um, is one called Energy, Environment, and the Climate. And he will present us some new data sets today um, that will be in the newest edition. And um, for those of you, for, uh, by the way, who ha um, have not um, watched any classes or online uh, lectures on climate change, he has a fantastic series of lecture um, titled Earth's Changing Climate on the Great Courses Platform. And um, I would let him show us some different forms of data at this point. Thank you, Chrissy, and thank you for having me. Um, I want to begin by saying I'm really impressed with the um, sort of level of scientific knowledge and scientific awareness among my composer colleagues here. Um, I actually learned something from Victoria about the amount of oxygen that plankton produced. I couldn't have given you that number. Um, so thank you. Um, uh, so I'm really impressed with, with, with all that you're doing. Um, I got into, I, I, I know nothing about music. I'm gonna say that right off the bat, absolutely nothing. Um, I started one music course in college. Um, but in 2005 at Middlebury College, we're a liberal arts college in Vermont, um, and we're very into um, interdisciplinary communications as much as we can be. In 2005, we held a, a big climate awareness event and we invited in a number of outside experts on climate um, and we, um, tried to get the science and humanities sides to uh, talk together. One of you mentioned C.P. Snow earlier. I think that might've been Chrissy. Uh, I have a lot to say about C.P. Snow a lot of, in many of my scientific talks uh, and trying to join the sciences and the humanities. And um, anyway, in that 2005 event, um, I had been teaching climate change since 1992 before it became a really popular thing. And I approached my colleague, Sue Tan, who's a composer at, at Middlebury College and uh, suggested, why don't we look at the data on the global temperature increase and, and make it into a musical piece? So Sue did that and she played it, I believe on her flute at this event. And I recently asked her if there was a recording of it, but there isn't. So I'm not gonna play any music to you. But um, uh, I, I'm, I was struck by how long ago that event was and how much of the climate picture um, Sue missed. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm aware of my 10 minutes or so. And I'm just going to show you some, um, a few of the data sets that I personally think might make good music. <laughs> Having already seen how sophisticated some of you are in joining multiple data sets, I suggest you go a lot further than what I'm going to show you and try to join some of these, these different data sets. So let me begin by sharing, uh, doing a quick screen share, and I'll show you a few of the data sets. Chrissy mentioned my book, Energy, Environment, and Climate, and I am uh, now working on the fourth edition of that book. So I've had occasion to update and revise some of the most important data sets in climate and energy. So let me begin my screen share. Um, got that? Is that good? Okay. Um, so, um, Here's my uh, <laughs> credentials, if, as it were. We're seeing the, the famous, um, let, me get my, uh, let me get my laser pointer up here. No, that's not working. Well, uh, here's the famous polar bear. We've seen other things from the Arctic. Here's the uh, actually second edition of my book, which I actually prefer to the third edition because the cover is more beautiful. And here's what <laughs> temperature distribution on planet Earth might look like at the end of the century. So let me move on and talk about several data sets. Um, this is a really iconic one that comes from uh, an earlier report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the one that came out in 2003-ish, it was the third assessment report. Um, and it shows the global temperature from the year 1000 now to 2020. And this is a very famous iconic graph. Uh, the first part of it, the stretch from the year 1000 to about 1850 is not real temperature data from thermometers, but proxies that are put together from uh, tree rings, 
ice cores, solar activity, sediments from lakes, a whole host of data that goes into uh, enabling scientists to reconstruct the temperature. But you look at this whole thing and you see this uh, roughly th uh, 900 year trend of roughly constant or possibly falling temperatures, of course, with a lot of fluctuation, and then this sudden upturn. Now, I don't know how in music you handle that, but clearly there's some drama here and uh, it would make a wonderful piece of music. Um, this famous graph, does anyone know the name of this? It's got a name, it's called the hockey stick. Uh, for its obvious shape. And it was developed by Mike Mann, who's now at uh, Penn State University. And um, when Mike came to be our big environmental speaker at Middlebury College, I presented him with a hockey stick from the uh, Middlebury's champion hockey team, which is now hanging on his. Um, <laughs> so that's the hockey stick. So, so what I guess I'm doing here is I'm challenging the composers <laughs> ways to turn the data I'm showing you into music. Um, and I'm giving you little titles here. So this might be the title. It might be called Anthropocene. Anthropocene, of course, is the name for the period we are now in. It's not yet the official geological name, but it may become so. The period when humankind has become so dominant that we control nature rather than the other way around. <clears throat> so the Anthropocene, the time of human ascendancy. And this is the temperature record from the Anthropocene. And this is a brand new record of the global temperatures. Um, it doesn't look particularly different from the earlier ones, but it's got some subtle changes. There's actually some reordering of some of the years when it's been hottest. And uh, given that Cambridge is a UK institution, um, this is probably the most authoritative um, record of global temperatures. It comes out of the UK from the University of East Anglia's Climatic Research Unit. And they just updated this one. And what you see here, um, this is uh, temperatures relative to the average of 1961 to 1990. It's just a random arbitrary number that doesn't matter, but any temperatures that look negative are below that average and any temperatures that look positive are above it. And what you see, of course, is a lot of fluctuation, but things pretty constant from 1850 to the early 20th century, a rise, a leveling off or even a slight fall uh, around the mid 20th century. We believe that's due to the uh, burst of industrial activity after World War II, particularly a lot of coal burning, putting uh, pollution into the sky, some of which reflects sunlight and actually makes it cooler. And then this dramatic rise, which we've all been focusing on uh, starting about the 1970s. I mentioned the event at Middlebury College that took place in 2005. So that was here and we had missed the most dramatic part that has yet that came after that. 2016, the warmest year on record, 2020, almost as warm. So this, re this record is brand new. They just got 2020, analyzed it in there, and then they reanalyzed all the other records. So that's the Anthropocene. So you can make a piece of music to the Anthropocene. <laughs> uh, here's a, a, a more two-dimensional uh, picture. This is a, a chart that NASA puts together each year and they've just released the one that goes up through 2020. And what you're seeing here is the uh, entire planet. You're seeing a scale that gives you the temperature deviation relative to some average. So blue is colder, yellow and red are warmer. I'm gonna play this as a movie and what it's gonna play or it's gonna run for 30 seconds and it's going to show you um, five year averages of the temperature. So my challenge to the composers is unlike the previous graph, which was just a sort of one dimensional rise in temperatures. This one shows you what's going on all over the globe. And I can imagine music that somehow <laughs> captures that, that fact of, of the temperature changes bouncing around and yet in the background of an overall warming. So let me play this one. <laughs> okay, now we're about 20th century. Nineteen thirty. Notice the Arctic, you Arctic composers, a lot of going on in the Arctic here. Here we are in the 1970s. Now it really starts to heat up. 2000. And here we are at 2020. So the world 2020 looks very different than it did um, in, 19, uh, in, in, 18, in 1980, 1880 when we started this run. Um, we did get a little bit of cooling just below Greenland, but a little bit around the Antarctic. But otherwise, everywhere else is a lot warmer. So there's a composition warming world. I challenge you to make that one. <laughs> uh, here's one I call carbon dioxide. Uh, this is the uh, carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere 
from the year 1750, roughly the start of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it's another one of these graphs that simply rises. This doesn't have a lot of fluctuation in it, uh, so there isn't a lot of interesting musical subtlety, but I'm going to show you a detail of this portion of it in just a minute. Today we're at 415 parts per million. That means if you took a million one-gallon milk jugs and filled them with air and separated them, you'd have 415 of them full of carbon dioxide. But here's the interesting part of this, at least musically. Um, if we blow up the part from about 1960 to the present, we see this wonderful fluctuation that's going on here. And before I tell you what that is and suggest you compose some music to that, let me show you where this data comes from physically. It comes from this place, uh, uh, Mauna Loa, active volcano in Hawaii. Uh, this is a monitoring station that's sitting on land, none of which is more than 150 years old. Whoops, how did that happen? I didn't mean to go there yet, hold on. Um, none of which is more than 150 years old. Uh, and the uh, readings are taken at the top of this tower, it's 10,000 feet above sea level, and sampling air from the very, the very pure air from the Pacific Ocean. So it's getting a worldwide record of carbon dioxide. And the beauty of it is it's so accurate, it's looking at all these little fluctuations. So let's look at those again. This one could be called the breathing earth, because what you're seeing here is uh, the Northern hemisphere has most of the forested land because the Northern hemisphere has most of the land. And so when the trees in the Northern hemisphere come out, they put out their leaves and begin taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere actually drops each year during the summer months from or starting in spring through the summer months. And then in the fall, when the trees, the deciduous trees anyway, lose their leaves, um, they cease to take carbon dioxide up, but they continue to respire to use energy as do all living things. And they put carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere. So we get this beautiful fluctuation in the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere. And it's often called the earth breathing. It literally is the plants of the Northern hemisphere which dominate doing the breathing. Um, when I teach climate change, I have my students analyze this data and I have them plot five successive years of data and they can see what's happening and they can, is that me, my cursor, or somebody else's cursor moving around there? They can see um, that these, uh, each year, you can see the carbon dioxide going uh, down in the spring and summer and then going up again in the winter. And if you plot five successive years, each one is a little bit higher because the overall trend in carbon dioxide continues to be upward. Um, here's one I'd call ice ages. This happens to be a graph of carbon dioxide concentration, but it might as well also be temperature over the last 400,000 years. This is taken from ice cores at the Vostok station in Antarctica, a Russian station, but it's an international uh, uh, group that did this work. And um, you can see this fluctuation and it's not random. It's occurring on roughly timescales of roughly 100,000 years. That cursor is moving about and it's not supposed to. There we go. <laughs> I think the wind is blowing out here. Anyway. Uh, so things have been fluctuating on a roughly 100,000 year time scale, and that's the uh, rise out of the ice ages and then back into the ice ages. And then uh, if you look at what humankind has done to the atmosphere, we've raised the carbon dioxide level to levels that haven't been seen for the last half a million years. And in fact, for the last million years, and probably for as far back as the last 20 million years. So this would be an interesting thing to make into a uh, piece of music. It's got a lot more variation and I don't know what you would do with that piece at the end, but that's not a cartoon. That's an actual graph of what we humans have done to the atmosphere. And if you'd like some harmony, um, you can look at the <laughs> temperature data at exactly the same period comes from the same ice core data and you can see that they're remarkably similar and I'm not going to go into it but the comparison of these two is part of what gives us the organization 350 Bill McKibben's organization that says we really need to hold the atmospheric CO2 concentration to no more than 350 parts per million um, so there we are uh, temperature on the upper curve uh, carbon dioxide on the lower curve put that together into a musical composition so I'm going to end there. Uh, just to remind you, I've showed you uh, six different pieces of data, all of which I think might make interesting musical compositions. And I look forward to another gathering in which perhaps you have done that. And I will stop sharing and I appreciate your interest in this.
<laughs> we might need a little time, Rich, to, to put these pieces together for you. Maybe the next uh, meeting could be <laughs> sometime in the future, <laughs> reasonably. <laughs> Yes. If anyone so, would like the raw data, if anyone would like the raw data, I can get it to you. Well, we've, we've, we've heard the data singing, we saw the data, and we saw different aspects of it. I would like now to open up the discussion that will be driven by our last person on the panel who has not yet spoken. Uh, Jonathan Impert uh, is um, uh, who is the Director of Research at the Orpheus Institute in Ghent, and uh, he's also an Associate Professor at Middlesex University in London. Um, his research um, are, cover many aspects of contemporary music practice. He's also a fantastic trumpet player, composer, and a theorist, and I would invite him now to open up the discussion among panelists and the attendees. Thanks, Chrissy. Uh, just in case I should lose the chance once we get stuck for time, can I just thank all the panelists for the privilege of, of experiencing your art and uh, and your thought. Really, it's been a very rich uh, experience. And thanks to, to Chrissy Perona and uh, Satinda for organizing this wonderful event as well. So first of all, I didn't want to miss the chance to, to say that. Uh, Richard's notion of the Anthropocene, um, in a way that's the common topic, it strikes me, uh, among uh, these different approaches to, to, to data-based art. If there's one, if there's one common thread that really sums it up, absolutely. Um, I don't see a lot of art concerned with data before human uh, major impact on the planet, uh, which already indicates something about um, the, what can we call it, the messaging? I don't know. I mean, in, in many ways, the cultural context for this is that uh, from some points of view, data processing, data representation, data simulation, it's shortly going to be the only job left on the planet for humans, right? So this has become our environment. This has become the stuff we deal with one way uh, or another. Um, it struck me that it's interesting to see how as soon as uh, a work of art comes into being, it detaches itself, not only from the artist, but from any, any intentions that the artist thought they were embodying in the work. Uh, so the, the degree to which it's really present or not is, is very, very interesting to me. And yet counterintuitively, perhaps, with this database work, the hand of the artist actually becomes clearer. You might imagine that there was a greater degree of, de degree of abstraction and not at all, as we've heard. I find this this very, uh, very interesting. I'm, I'm interested in, in people's views as to why that might be. Um, and then, I mean, it opens up so many questions for me, which is obviously the sign of, of, of good work. I mean, a, a, of, a, of a vital, vital topic. It's consciousness changing. It's the, that's the, the work of the work of art, obviously questions about uh, the degree to which we just find nature beautiful, or we think we find nature beautiful, or we project ourselves onto nature and find it beautiful, or we choose the bits of nature that we find beautiful, uh, uh, which of course is a double-edged sword, because if we're trying, if there is a degree of messaging, shall we say, in the art, then um, choosing the aspects of data that please us in some respect might actually work against us. Um, then apparent relevance, of course, uh, makes a big difference. I was just watching the, Richard Lost film, the, 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 the warming world, um, chillingly produced just down the road from my house. Um, if, if, if we'd actually reached the point of, of, of burnout, if we didn't know this was the warming world, our world in which we live, uh, we might find that beautiful. So there's uh, an element of, of explicit relevance there. There's the authority of data, the, de the degree to which um, the degree to which the artist feels empowered to manipulate or interfere with the data. Uh, there's the question of messaging I've already mentioned. Uh, Victoria suggests that she do whatever it takes to raise awareness. Uh, whereas Chrissy described Daniel's piece as an analog of the data, and it's actually that they're not quite, they're not quite the same relationship with it. 
uh, natural data also provides us with a wonderful provides us with a wonderful means of generating complex form as well of course more complex or more rich uh, than perhaps uh, we're capable of of, um, of generating by other means uh, and you see instances of that in things like cages use of use of star maps the the etudes boreal Austral. Um, Chris used the term pragmatic. No, he didn't use the word programmatic. I can't read my own writing, it's very difficult. Pro programmatic, that's unavoidable. Programmatic, that is there's something metaphorical, there's something resonant of what we imagine this will sound like. Uh, and perhaps it's an open question. If that were not there, would we catch any relevance of this data at all? Um, uh, Sasha Melnikov, a great pianist, uh, sent a little film he'd made recently under lockdown, stuck in a hotel in Japan, um, about uh, meteorological simulations, he thinks of them as, in Beethoven. And he says we shouldn't think of this as programmatic. Now, Sasha is a, is a pilot. That's what he does for fun. So his meteorological awareness is, is, uh, is quite acute. And he goes through various instances and he says, no, no, this isn't, this isn't just, hey, this sounds a bit like thunder or this sounds a bit like the rain or whatever. He says, no, 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 it's much more precise than that. And it's no coincidence, of course, that that coincides with um, the beginning of our post-industrial world. Of, no, not post-industrial, about the beginning of our industrial world. Uh, and this sort of, you know, the, like the romantic relationship with nature arises from the, from the same thing, of course. So there's some kind of level of analogy to our imagined experience of nature, uh, some kind of uh, some kind of analog going there. Then the question of how you map this data into um, data representation, if you like, how you how you map it into a into an artwork, and uh, questions of style or taste they must intervene there, and perhaps panelists will be interesting to. It would be interesting to hear you say something about that because decisions have to be made on, on the on the most basic level, just bringing data into cognitive range, if you like, you know, the work of sonification, to be able to to hear stuff, to hear pattern, to hear periodicity that you might not notice otherwise, you might not notice uh, in other projections of the data. And then there's the question of the purity of that data, how much to to intervene. Um, the relationship between field materials, recordings, documentary materials. Why is a field recording more data-like, for example, than a painting? That would interest me to know. It probably is, but I'm not quite sure. There are questions of performance. So, Chrissy, playing this stuff, I mean, if it's, if it's data, what right have you got to, to, to interpret it? No, to accent one note rather than another. Do you not feel well, some? I think you're absolutely right. One of the reasons that we I, I, I went for the first time with for this piece is this my first our first reaction to sound is emotional. Right? So we can see data, we can think about data, we can talk about oh yes, we're influencing the environment versus the other. But when you hear the sound coming out of it, we cannot help it. It's emotional. Right. That adds a layer to our to our attachment to it. We might not be able to see the exact patterns, etc., but they're there. And music is all carries all this non-semantic. Um, I, I would think you know uh, it's in this non-semantic language that can carry any message and you can understand from different ways and facets. So I think in a way uh, we can all relate to rather than seeing you know just the chart of the numbers and say okay i can see something here i can read this but when we hear a piece specifically sonification even if the lay if there are layers of data somehow we can just physically we're made up like that we can actually um pick dynamic changes you know in in multiple data sets the sonification becomes makes the data more transparent from a physiological point of view so it's it, it's actually you know our body and our emotions that they're faster to react to it so i think it's a very very strong tool um to deal with data uh, for instance when you know you you 
it's absolutely not very uh, transparent in the first place, as you say, for somebody who listens to it for the first time. But as we go into it and as we dig further and further, um, we, we get a different aspect of it. And I'm not sure if the composers um, uh, start from that point of view, but for me, that, that, is, that is one of the motivation to, to actually approach these pieces and perform them. Perhaps one of our panelists has uh, something to say. How, how much do you have to process the data before you find it beautiful? <laughs> I don't know what you mean by beautiful. <laughs> okay, well, that's already it. Well, uh, um, worthy of incorporation in your art, let's put it that way, worthy, um, warranting. Well, I, I mean, to, to backtrack to your first question, why is it important to use data? There's many reasons, but to me, it, it becomes more and more important in the post-factual world where we actually use the source to be something that's a scientific data that can become very poetic and it can be changed around however uh, an artist feels or moves into it or adds emotion to it um, and, and gives us access to it. So data by itself can be really inaccessible. And uh, at the same time, if you allow people to dig deeper and they find that what it's based on is something that's actually part of natural systems that we've measured and created into data, then they have access to the invisible, to the inaudible, to understand things like the virus can actually infect you. But because you don't see it, you don't hear it, it's not there. So um, I think it's sometimes important to even uh, uh, amplify and create noise that you can't hear so that people get a sense of different aspects of reality that we have such a narrow field of vision and audio um, and that allows us that it goes beyond uh, what our senses can tap into. But don't we have quite a narrow channel, actually, of cognitive? Incredibly uh, narrow, but <laughs> but the you know there's all kinds of instruments now that allow us to go beyond the visual and audible realm, and that's what that's data, and that data can be translated into anything. It can be a vision, a visual, it can be audio, but it's not what we see. It's just numbers. Yeah. That's so fascinating. I mean, you know the counter argument, uh, which I wouldn't subscribe to, but that uh, if you present it in the same manner, uh, with the same narrative, with the same sonic and visual materials, but made up the data or use data from a completely other source, uh, who would know? Right. Yeah. That you were the you use the word source. I think that's the key. It's what is the source? Is it something that you're just inventing, or it's something that you're grabbing that's got the it's grounding? What so are the, there's a deeply ethical component to this. Sorry, Matthew. Oh no, no, finish, please. I was just gonna. I was just asking whether there's a deeply ethical component to this that perhaps distinguishes it from from some other modes of art making. I was thinking along those lines that the, you know, the that art and music have always been uh, engaged with with a conceptual dimension, right? So there's always, you know, Chris mentioned the love songs earlier, and now we're talking about you know climate change, and um, th those things are not really so so different in that they they bring a kind of uh, concept into the material creation of a form of in aesthetics that's that's really uh, for the purpose of aesthetics. Um, so in the fact that we're using, say, data sets instead of uh, stories of love lost or whatever, you know, there's a there's a difference in the way we're working with that with that material. But I think it's also worth recognizing that that the the scientific data that we're talking about is based in um, 
observation and measurement. And it's not, you know, it is already a kind of, of interpretation of what's happening in the world. It's not perfect. And it's something that, you know, um, it, it's it, in that we interpret it, we're interpreting an interpretation that has a basis in something that we can kind of comes out of the scientific method, but, but yet it's um, still uh, partial, imperfect, and um, open to, to question a new discovery, which makes it, in my opinion, the, the, a very kind of ripe area for further interpretation, for aestheticization, for thinking through you know, the, the implications of human nature interaction. And, um, and it flows very smoothly into the world of art and music as a result. I, I, I second what Matthew just said, and I, I'm thinking also I'm responding to a question in the chat about uh, to what extent can we call this data actually natural? And Matthew is pointing out that there's already an interpretation by the time the data lands in your uh, computer or wherever, it's been interpreted by the technology that we put out there to gather it. And we think that that technology is reflecting the real world but we also know that all our attempts to interact with the world and, and interpret it and get data from it also affect it. So it's a, you know, it goes, sort of goes both ways. I was thinking about that, in fact, in, in the context of Matthew's work, that um, one might think of the data collecting devices uh, in old speak as musical instruments. So the instruments become your whole means of interfacing with the world rather than thinking of it as science that generates data that you then sign Yeah, it's, somewhere. you know, for me, I've, I've, I emphasize the in situ interaction with the world as partially in response to that. Like I really want to be there and experience the, the place myself, make my own field recordings, you know, see the sensors. I'm really a big into that and, um, uh, you know, my students know that, <laughs> I emphasize that for, for their, their own projects, but it's partially because of that, because, you know, you can, by understanding what the, what the instruments are doing, you have a better sense of how they may be representing the, the, the world. It's very interesting, and, and I suppose some of the imagery associated with these works supports that. I was thinking in Daniel's piece when you were playing that, Chris, um, the, the presence of the ship actually makes the viewer more subject. You become a present subject in the listening experience in a different way to you know, just a blank lens. Yes, we're more participant in it. We yeah. are on the ship, right? We're taking a, we're taking a, a, stroll, yeah. a scroll around and um, um, I think the, the first time I have to say, I have to bring it back to Chris though, because the first time I started being super, very interested in this, uh, you know, data to sound actually, it was the first time I heard the tomato content. And so it was a fascinating um, thing to discover. And then um, I've, I've seen a lot of his work, his body of work deals with everything. So Chris has pieces, you know, about uh, CO2 over cities and pollution data. And we have a piece that I actually was was really very keen to play today, but we couldn't for technicalities, is there are the sensors that they measure CO2 within a concert hall, right? And we can use Whoa. the audience to interact with us. And there's, uh, you know, electronic sounds that are generated by the breathing. So you can actually orchestrate the breathing or somebody from the public can orchestrate the breathing and you can interact with that. And it is so direct. Um, so the, the graph is there, you can see data, but the relationship that it creates via technology, right? So it mitigated, but it is, it is very, very direct. So it can be fascinating actually to work with. <laughs> The presence of the sea was uh, a common yes. factor. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was just remembering a project at CERN who produced, a lot, of course, a lot of data, but it, it, there's something about uh, certain kinds of form that, of course, we, that resonate with us. And the sea produces, I was thinking of, well, a, a late colleague of Chris's, Michel Serre, uh, 
whose work about music, I mean, whose philosophy of science is uh, all of the metaphors are from music and the sea entirely. Um, and they're almost interchangeable very often. Is there any, do any of the panelists feel that the, the sea has some sort of particular resonance in this respect or is it just coincidence this evening? No. I no. think that might have yeah. been my my heavy handed in curating maybe the, the first <laughs> pieces on this playlist. And you know, <laughs> I was looking at the bottom like I really need to get out. It's COVID time, so we really need <laughs> no, to be out on this sea, right? <laughs> it, clearly, it has this uh, this this breathing quality. Um, it it brings together the almost human that is this this the rhythmic movement. Mm -hmm. And the uh, and that which is beyond human control in the way that say star maps as Cage used them he used them precisely in order not to have this kind of human rhythm or figure uh, in his work I feel uh, so clearly the sea um, produces the right kind of data <laughs> or coasts coasts are you know the where the sea and the land meet where the you know we these systems. Uh, come into interface. Um, it could be about coasts and not 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 just the the ocean as well. Um, I, I mean, I think we're we're talking pretty about a about a cycle of like hydrologics and about you know climate that um, really integrates different atmosphere and the oceans and the landforms and you know perhaps the coast is where this uh, this you know this intersects the um, these forces. Hi, everybody. I have to go. I'm so sorry. I really, really enjoyed meeting everybody, and I will definitely stay in touch. Great Bye. to see you again, Bye. Victoria. Bye. Take care. Victoria, yeah. nice yeah, to see you. Yeah, same here. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Um, before uh, wrapping it up, I would like us to actually look a little bit in the uh, the questions by some of the attendees. We have a few questions if you would like to just check on them a second um, so that we can maybe give some brief answers. Um, These are very good questions, by the way. Thank you, mm -hmm. everyone who's been putting them in and waiting patiently with your hands up. <laughs> I feel bad. <laughs> but yeah, good good idea, Chrissy. Let's look at these. Uh, the first one was was already good, right? It's about science communication, um, how what the function of the art Mm -hmm. The music, in particular, is in communication of, in science, and um, that's a really interesting idea. It's often mentioned that um, that the arts can help communicate, can help make connections to people uh, about you know these these issues that are the scientists have been telling us about for years, and we readily ignore perhaps because they appear in you know in forms that aren't um, accessible or attractive, and so maybe art can can do that. I. I think in my in my own way of thinking about this that um, that the that the art can um, help science be more communicative that that is something that it that it might do and 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 I'm always like hoping to help the scientists in the way that they think that that could happen but but conversely um, I also feel like the science can make the the artwork more relevant and the scientists have been very generous in providing their data and explaining it in ways that that I can incorporate it into the music that it can become relevant. So there's this kind of, you know, it's really a collaboration. Um, so I, I don't really think of it as being primarily about helping science be communicative, even though that may be one of the outcomes of the many things that are that are productive and positive about that collaboration. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add, you know, that it's a very, very uh, immediate topic for for a lot of us. I'm, I'm I'm sure I'm speaking for a whole bunch of people when I say that, you know, we uh, we we find this relevant relevance um, kind of a new thing. I mean, there's a lot of new things going on here. Even the fact that we can hook up, you know, observations and real time sensors to music. You know, it's 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 a product of technological advancement, and the ease of doing that is 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 
increasing, you know, rapidly. So, I mean, it's, it's a practice that, that wasn't there a hundred years ago. And if it's a practice that we know about now increasingly, and if, if uh, for example, Stanford University decides that it's going to add its uh, eighth school. So we have, we have seven schools traditionally at Stanford and now a new one as, as a result of very long range planning and like, is it time? Open an eighth school. This is a big deal here. The eighth school is the school of sustainability. And who, what's, you know, okay. So that's very cross cutting. It's getting its definition right now. Um, and so I've been asked, you know, where, you know, I'm, I'm all for it and I want to participate. How do I participate? You know, what, 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 what would I say to the, you know, the, you know, engineers and scientists and the sustainability researchers and all the uh, social sciences going in. It's a huge, huge mix. Where's my role? I, uh, I like to think that I can immediately define that as science communication. I mean, that's a, just a first step, but it's a really easy one for everybody to understand. And I've had those moments that have touched that, you know, in, in, in recent years where um, you know, for example, the hockey stick curve, uh, doing a sonification of that for TV, where, you know, it's exactly the frame that Rich showed. And uh, in a way, a sonification of that is like putting, taking a photograph, you put a frame around it, you, 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 you establish whatever contrast that you want. Well, anyway, you listen to this thing just exactly as you saw it. It's in real time, then the wham. After that wham part, you can just say any questions <laughs> because it's so dramatic. Uh, and you know, the picture is dramatic and these are one for one, but when you hear it, there's, 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 it, it hits you differently. Right. And, and that's the reaction I get. And I, I like to feel that is an aspect of communication. So, so my answer is yes, that's part of it. We have a couple more great questions in the, chat here if we have time. Uh, firstly, to what extent it might be possible for sound science to become an outcome of art to reverse the roles in any way? Can I just say something here? I, I was just thinking about Victoria. I know she's gone, but this is something that she had been deeply committed to. Um, so in her collaborations with scientists, it's very important for her that there is new science emerging from their collaboration. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to see how she does that. But uh, I will just, I just wanted to mention that um, this, is, this is something that I know is, uh, is what she does. So quite literally scientists will produce papers in nature of stuff that they wouldn't have thought of doing before but it's emerged out of this dialogue with the artist um, and the way the artist perceives it and asks questions or sees something that maybe the scientist wouldn't have attended to or noticed. Maybe, maybe I'll jump in again, just to, just to put a, you know, sort of set of case histories can be found where, you know, investigations and, you know, kind of artistically inspired are reaching a little bit ahead, you know, that, 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 that you, you, you find yourself investigating something you don't fully understand. It's, it's an investigation from an artistic point of view, and it might just be a little bit ahead of where, you know, say the physics are going. And, and you know, if we look at, you know, cases of that, the, the uh, you know, sort of emerging science of chaos that, that happened during um, the 60s, um, literally was, was discoveries by ear of chaos and the rhythms of dripping water faucets. I mean, you know, so, so it's, it's listening, it's perception, it's, um, you know, playing around with material that, that intuitively feels right and gets you there. And then the science catches up just by a you know, fraction. I mean, one leads, the other leads, and maybe they're not one or the other. Maybe they're actually more joined than we, 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 we give them, you know, credit for sometimes, you know, when we do a disservice by 
siloing, right? I wonder whether that might relate to uh, the other fascinating question here, the extent to which we can describe these data as natural in that they arise from a series of human choices. In a way, that relates to that. That is, uh, it's once they become, once they come within the, the, the purview of human awareness, that they can be mediated in this way until you can sense temperature data for several thousand years it's very difficult to to build any kind of relationship with it or, or, or find form in it i don't know if anybody has any any response to that question particularly i i think that that's right the um the the you know the fact is that that a lot of the work is involved in how we're going to sense you know how so observation and then measurement and then how you measure and then how you can store and access those measurements over some period of time that would be relevant for drawing any kind of um, uh, knowledge from that, whether that be in the realm of science or in aesthetics, um, that there's quite a lot of, of overlap there. Um, I was going to, oh, I've, now I've forgotten what I was thinking about. Just I wanted to just touch on the previous question. Uh, Oh shoot, it's escaped me a little bit, but um, oh, it was the relevancy Here, of, it was, about, it was about the contribution of art into science, if there was any kind of um, value in that and Chris's idea that the, that the, that the, um, the artist may be kind of working ahead in some, in some ways, or at least artistic practice. Let's not embody the artist in necessarily one thing and the scientist in another thing. They can be of the same person, you know. Um, but but that that in, that the way that we're working with music and environmental sciences, you know, rooted in the the data and the observations and sometimes even in methodologies that overlap. But it's also into fiction, and so there's this kind of willingness that's really different in art. Um, from science that to move into into the realm of fiction and and that happens very fluidly we're not held to the same standard as scientists that we have to do everything very carefully and have it all peer reviewed at any moment we can kind of freely advance by the same uh, by ex by extension we're not held to you know the funding models are totally different so the way is that we have to create work is not based in um, kind of incrementally advancing uh, knowledge that that came before exactly it can it happens more um, you know freely and intuitively and that may be an advantage to have that mode of thinking engaged with the scientific project it may like Chris was saying, kind of inspire new ways of, of thinking about the, the data, new ways of interpreting the environment that could drive scientific research forward. Papers could result from that that wouldn't have been written before. Um, so, you know, I would offer those two observations. Thanks. Yeah, it's meetings like this that make it start to germinate even faster. It's great. I, I'm, I'm afraid I have to leave the meeting because I'm late for another meeting. So um, it's been I have to delight. leave as well, yeah. And uh, again, hello to all sorts of friends. And you know, mm -hmm. the, the 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 necessarily one-way aspect of this is is always kind of like frustrating. So anyway, big <laughs> hellos and goodbyes. Thank you, thank you so thank much you. to thank all. Thank you, everyone.